Chapter Eight of the Story of the Amulet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of the Amulet by Edith Nesbit. Chapter Eight, The Queen in London. Now tell us what happened to you," said Cyril to Jane when he and the others had told her all about the Queen's talk and the banquet and the variety entertainment, carefully stopping short before the beginning of the dungeon part of the story. It wasn't much good going," said Jane. "If you didn't even try to get the amulet, we found out it was no go," said Cyril. "It's not to be got in Babylon. It was lost before that. We'll go to some other jolly, friendly place where everyone is kind and pleasant, and look for it there. Now, tell us about your part." "Oh," said Jane. "The Queen's man with the smooth face. What was his name?" Ritti Marduk said Cyril. Yes, said Jane. Ritti Marduk. He came for me just after the Samiad had bitten the guard of the gate's wife's little boy, and he took me to the palace, and we had supper with the new little queen from Egypt. She is a dear, not much older than you. She told me heaps about Egypt, and we played ball after supper, and then the Babylon queen sent for me. I like her too. And she talked to the Samiad, and I went to sleep, and then you woke me up. That's all. The Samiad, roused from its sound sleep, told the same story. But it added, "What possessed you to tell that queen that I could give wishes? I sometimes think you were born without even the most rudimentary imitation of brains." The children did not know the meaning of rudimentary. But it sounded a rude, insulting word. I don't see that we did any harm," said Cyril sulkily. "Oh no," said the Samiad with withering irony. "Not at all. Of course not. Quite the contrary. Exactly so. Only she happened to wish that she might soon find herself in your country, and soon might mean any moment." Then it's your fault," said Robert, "because you might just as well have made soon mean some moment next year or next century. That's where you, as so often happens, make the mistake," rejoined the Sand Fairy. "I couldn't mean anything but what she meant by soon. It wasn't my wish, and what she meant was the next time the king happens to go out lion hunting." So she'll have a whole day, and perhaps two, to do as she wishes with. She doesn't know about time only being a mode of thought. Well," said Cyril with a sigh of resignation. "We must do what we can to give her a good time. She was jolly decent to us. I say, suppose we were to go to St James Park after dinner and feed those ducks that we never did feed." After all that Babylon and all those years ago, I feel as if I should like to see something real and now. You'll come, Samiad. Where's my priceless woven basket of sacred rushes? Asked the Samiad morosely. I can't go out with nothing on, and I won't. What's more? And then everybody remembered with pain that the bass bag had, in the hurry of departure from Babylon, not been remembered. But it's not so extra precious," said Robert hastily. "You can get them given to you for nothing if you buy fish in Farringdon Market." "Oh," said the Samiad very crossly indeed. "So you presume on my sublime indifference to the things of this disgusting modern world to fob me off." With a travelling equipage that costs you nothing, very well. I shall go to sand. Please don't wake me. And it went then and there to sand, which, as you know, meant to bed. The boys went to St James's Park to feed the ducks, but they went alone. Anthea and Jane sat sewing all the afternoon. They cut off half a yard from each of their best green liberty sashes. A towel cut in two formed a lining, and they sat and sewed and sewed and sewed. 
what they were making was a bag for the samiad each worked at a half of the bag jane's half had four-leafed shamrocks embroidered on it they were the only things she could do because she had been taught how at school and fortunately some of the silk she had been taught with was left over and even so anthea had to draw the pattern for her anthea's side of the bag had letters on it worked hastily but affectionately in chain stitch they were something like this sam's travel car she would have put travelling carriage but she made the letters too big so there was no room the bag was made into a bag with old nurse's sewing machine and the strings of it were anthea's and jane's best hair ribbons at tea-time when the boys had come home with a most unfavourable report of the st james's park ducks anthea ventured to awaken the samiad and to show it its new travelling bag Humph it said sniffing a little contemptuously yet at the same time affectionately it's not so dusty the samiad seemed to pick up very easily the kind of things that people said nowadays for a creature that had in its time associated with megatheriums and pterodactyls its quickness was really wonderful it's more worthy of me it said than the kind of bag that's given away with a pound of place when do you propose to take me out in it i should like a rest from taking you or us anywhere said cyril but jane said i want to go to egypt i did like that egyptian princess that came to marry the king in babylon she told me about the larks they have in egypt and the cats do let's go there and i told her what the bird things on the amulet were like and she said it was egyptian writing the others exchanged looks of silent rejoicing at the thought of their cleverness in having concealed from jane the terrors they had suffered in the dungeon below the euphrates egypt's so nice too jane went on because of dr brewer's scripture history i would like to go there when joseph was dreaming those curious dreams or when moses was doing wonderful things with snakes and sticks oh, i don't care about snakes said anthea shuddering well we needn't be in at that part but babylon was lovely we had cream and sweet sticky stuff and i expect egypt's the same there was a good deal of discussion but it all ended in everybody's agreeing to jane's idea and next morning directly after breakfast which was kipper's and very nice the samiad was invited to get into his travelling carriage the moment after it had done so with stiff furry reluctance like that of a cat when you want to nurse it and its ideas are not the same as yours old nurse came in well chickies she said are you feeling very dull oh no nurse dear said anthea we're having a lovely time we're just going off to see some old ancient relics ah said old nurse the royal academy i suppose don't go wasting your money too reckless that's all she cleared away the kipper bones and the tea things and when she had swept up the crumbs and removed the cloth the amulet was held up and the order given just as duchesses and other people give it to their coachman to egypt please said anthea when cyril had uttered the wonderful name of power when moses was there added jane and there in the dingy fitzroy street dining-room the amulet grew big and it was an arch and through it they saw a blue blue sky and a running river no stop said cyril and pulled down jane's hand with the amulet in it <laughs> what silly cuckoos we all are he said of course we can't go we daren't leave home for a single minute now for fear that minute should be the minute what minute be what minute asked jane impatiently trying to get her hand away from cyril the minute when the queen of babylon comes said cyril and then every one saw it for some days life flowed in a very slow dusty uneventful stream the children could never go out all at once because they never knew when the king of babylon would go out lion hunting and leave his queen free to pay them that surprise visit to which she was without doubt eagerly looking forward 
so they took it in turns two and two to go out and to stay in the stay-at-homes would have been much duller than they were but for the new interest taken in them by the learned gentleman he called anthea in one day to show her a beautiful necklace of purple and gold beads i saw one like that she said in in the british museum perhaps i like to call the place where i saw it babylon said anthea cautiously a pretty fancy said the learned gentleman and quite correct too because as a matter of fact these beads did come from babylon the other three were all out that day the boys had been going to the zoo and jane had said so plaintively i'm sure i'm fonder of rhinoceroses than either of you are that anthea had told her to run along then and she had run catching the boys before that part of the road where fitzroy street suddenly becomes fitzroy square i think babylon is most frightfully interesting said anthea i do have such interesting dreams about it at least not dreams exactly but quite as wonderful do sit down and tell me said he so she sat down and told and he asked her a lot of questions and she answered them as well as she could wonderful wonderful he said at last one's heard of thought transference but i never thought i had any power of that sort yet it must be that and very bad for you i should think doesn't your headache very much he suddenly put a cold thin hand on her forehead no thank you not at all said she i assure you it is not done intentionally he went on of course i know a good deal about babylon and i unconsciously communicate it to you you've heard of thought reading but some of the things you say i don't understand they never enter my head and yet they're so astoundingly probable it's all right said anthea reassuringly i understand and don't worry it's all quite simple really it was not quite so simple when anthea having heard the others come in went down and before she had time to ask how they had liked the zoo heard a noise outside compared to which the wild beasts noises were gentle as singing birds good gracious cried anthea what's that the loud hum of many voices came through the open window words could be distinguished here's a guy this ain't november that ain't no guy it's a ballot lady that's what it is not it it's a bloomin loony i tell you then came a clear voice that they knew retire slaves it said what she is saying of cried a dozen voices some blame it foreign lingo one voice replied the children rushed to the door a crowd was on the road and pavement in the middle of the crowd plainly to be seen from the top of the steps were the beautiful face and bright veil of the babylonian queen jiminy cried robert and ran down the steps here she is here he cried look out let the lady pass she's a friend of ours coming to see us nice friend for a respectable house snorted a fat woman with marrows on a handcart all the same the crowd made way a little the queen met robert on the pavement and cyril joined them the samiad bag still on his arm here he whispered here's the samiad you can get wishes i wish you'd come in a different dress if you had to come said robert but it's no use my wishing anything no said the queen i wish i was dressed no i don't i wish they were dressed properly then they wouldn't be so silly the samiad blew itself out till the bag was a very tight fit for it and suddenly every man woman and child in that crowd felt that it had not enough clothes on for of course the queen's idea of proper dress was the dress that had been proper for the working classes three thousand years ago in babylon and there was not much of it lucky me said the marrow selling woman whatever could it took me to come out this figure and she wheeled her cart away very quickly indeed someone has made a pretty guy of you talk of guys 
said a man who sold bootlaces. "'Well, don't you talk,' said the man next to him. "'Look at your own silly legs, and where's your boots?' "'I never come out like this. I'll take my secret,' said the bootlace seller. "'I wasn't quite myself last night, I'll own, but not to dress up like a circus.' The crowd was all talking at once, and getting rather angry, but no one seemed to think of blaming the Queen. Anthea bounded down the steps and pulled her up. The others followed, and the door was shut. "'Blood if I can make it out,' they heard. "'I'm a form I am.' And the crowd, coming slowly to the same mind, dispersed, followed by another crowd of persons who were not dressed in what the Queen thought was the proper way. "'We shall have the police here directly,' said Anthea in the tones of despair. "'Oh, why did you come dressed like that?' The queen leaned against the arm of the horsehair sofa. "'How else can a queen dress, I should like to know?' she questioned. "'Our queen wears things like other people,' said Cyril. "'Well, I don't. And I must say,' she remarked in an injured tone, "'that you don't seem very glad to see me now I have come. But perhaps it's the surprise that makes you behave like this.' yet you ought to be used to surprises the way you vanished i shall never forget it the best magic i've ever seen how did you do it oh never mind about that now said robert you see you've gone and upset all those people and i expect they'll fetch the police and we don't want to see you collared and put in prison you can't put queens in prison she said loftily oh can't you said cyril we cut off a king's head here once in this miserable room how frightfully interesting no no not in this room in history oh in that said the queen disparagingly i thought you'd done it with your own hands the girls shuddered what a hideous city yours is the queen went on pleasantly and what horrid ignorant people do you know they actually can't understand a single word i say can you understand them asked jane of course not they speak some vulgar northern dialect i can understand you quite well i really am not going to explain again how it was that the children could understand other languages than their own so thoroughly, and talk them too, so that it felt and sounded to them just as though they were talking English. Well, said Cyril bluntly, now you've seen just how horrid it is, don't you think you might as well go home again? Why, I've seen simply nothing yet, said the Queen, arranging her starry veil. I wish to be at your door, and I was. Now I must go and see your king and queen. Nobody's allowed to, said Anthea in haste. But look here, we'll take you and show you anything you'd like to see, anything you can see, she added kindly, because she remembered how nice the queen had been to them in Babylon, even if she had been a little deceitful in the matter of Jane and Samiad. There's the museum, said Cyril hopefully. There are lots of things from your country there. If only we could disguise you a little. I know, said Anthea suddenly. Mother's old theatre cloak, and there are lots of her old hats in the big box. The blue silk, lace-trimmed cloak did indeed hide some of the Queen's startling splendours, but the hat fitted very badly. It had pink roses in it, and there was something about the coat or the hat or the Queen that made her look somehow not very respectable. Oh, never mind, said Anthea, when Cyril whispered this. The thing is to get her out before Nurse has finished her forty winks. I should think she's got to about the thirty-ninth wink by now. Come on, then, said Robert. You know how dangerous it is. Let's make haste into the museum. If any of those people you made guise of do fetch the police, they won't think of looking for you there. The blue silk coat and the pink rosed hat attracted almost as much attention as the royal costume had done, and the children were uncommonly glad to get out of the noisy streets into the grey quiet of the museum. 
parcels and umbrellas to be left here said a man at the counter the party had no umbrellas and the only parcel was the bag containing the samiad which the queen had insisted should be brought i'm not going to be left said the samiad softly so don't you think it i'll wait outside with you said anthea hastily and went to sit on the seat near the drinking fountain don't sit so near that nasty fountain said the creature crossly i might get splashed anthea obediently moved to another seat and waited indeed she waited and waited and waited and waited and waited the samiad dropped into an uneasy slumber anthea had long ceased to watch the swing door that always let out the wrong person and she was herself almost asleep and still the others did not come back it was quite a start when anthea suddenly realized that they had come back and that they were not alone behind them was quite a crowd of men in uniform and several gentlemen were there everyone seemed very angry now go said the nicest of the angry gentlemen take the poor demented thing home and tell your parents she ought to be properly looked after if you can't get her to go we must send for the police said the nastiest gentleman but we don't wish to use harsh measures added the nice one who was really very nice indeed and seemed to be over all the others may i speak to my sister a moment first asked robert the nicest gentleman nodded and the officials stood round the queen the others forming a sort of guard while robert crossed over to anthea everything you can think of he replied to anthea's glance of inquiry kicked up the most frightful shine in there said those necklaces and earrings and things in the glass cases were all hers would have them out of the cases tried to break the glass she did break one bit everybody in the place has been at her no good i only got her out by telling her that was the place where they cut queen's heads off oh bobs what a whacker you'd have told a whacking or one to get her out besides it wasn't i meant mummy queens how do you know they don't cut off mummy's heads to see how the embalming is done what i want to say is can't you get her to go with you quietly i'll try said anthea and went up to the queen do come home she said the learned gentleman in our house has a much nicer necklace than anything they've got here come and see it the queen nodded you see said the nastiest gentleman she does understand english i was talking babylonian i think said anthea bashfully my good child said the nice gentleman what you're talking is not babylonian but nonsense you must go home at once and tell your parents exactly what has happened anthea took the queen's hand and gently pulled her away the other children followed and the black crowd of angry gentlemen stood on the steps watching them it was when the little party of disgraced children with the queen who had disgraced them had reached the middle of the courtyard that her eyes fell on the bag where the samiad was she stopped short i wish she said very loud and clear that all those babylonian things would come out to me here slowly so that those dogs and slaves can see the working of the great queen's magic oh you are a tiresome woman said the samiad in its bag but it puffed itself out next moment there was a crash the glass swing doors and all their framework were smashed suddenly and completely the crowd of angry gentlemen sprang aside when they saw what had done this but the nastiest of them was not quick enough and he was roughly pushed out of the way by an enormous stone bull that was floating steadily through the door it came and stood beside the queen in the middle of the courtyard it was followed by more stone images by great slabs of carved stone bricks helmets tools weapons fetters wine jars bowls bottles vases jugs saucers seals and the round long things something like rolling pins with marks on them like the print of little bird feet necklaces collars rings armlets earrings heaps and heaps and heaps of things 
far more than any one had time to count or even to see distinctly all the angry gentlemen had abruptly sat down on the museum steps except the nice one he stood with his hands in his pockets just as though he was quite used to seeing great stone bulls and all sorts of small babylonish objects float out into the museum yard but he sent a man to close the big iron gates a journalist who was just leaving the museum spoke to robert as he passed theosophy i suppose he said is she mrs besant yes said robert recklessly the journalist passed through the gates just before they were shut he rushed off to fleet street and his paper got out a new edition within half an hour mrs besant and theosophy impertinent miracle at the british museum people saw it in fat black letters on the boards carried by the sellers of newspapers some few people who had nothing better to do went down to the museum on the tops of omnibuses but by the time they got there there was nothing to be seen for the babylonian queen had suddenly seen the closed gates had felt the threat of them and had said i wish we were in your house and of course instantly they were the samiad was furious look here it said they'll come after you and they'll find me there'll be a national cage built for me at westminster and i shall have to work at politics why wouldn't you leave the things in their places what a temper you have haven't you said the queen serenely i wish all the things were back in their places will that do for you the samiad swelled and shrank and spoke very angrily i can't refuse to give your wishes it said but i can bite and i will if this goes on now then ah don't whispered anthea close to its bristling ear it's dreadful for us too don't you desert us perhaps she'll wish herself at home again soon not she said the samiad a little less crossly take me to see your city said the queen the children looked at each other if we had some money we could take her about in a cab people wouldn't notice her so much then but we haven't sell this said the queen taking a ring from her finger they'd only think we'd stolen it said cyril bitterly and put us in prison all roads lead to prison with you it seems said the queen the learned gentleman said anthea and ran up to him with the ring in her hand look here she said will you buy this for a pound oh he said in tones of joy and amazement and took the ring into his hand it's my very own said anthea it was given to me to sell i'll lend you a pound said the learned gentleman with pleasure and i'll take care of the ring for you who did you say gave it to you we call her said anthea carefully the queen of babylon is it a game he asked hopefully it'll be a pretty game if i don't get the money to pay for cabs for her said anthea i sometimes think he said slowly that i am becoming insane or that or that i am but i'm not and you're not and she's not does she say that she's the queen of babylon he uneasily asked yes said anthea recklessly this thought transference is more far-reaching than i imagined he said i suppose i have unconsciously influenced her too i never thought my babylonish studies would bear fruit like this horrible there are more things in heaven and earth yes said anthea heaps more and the pound is the thing i want more than anything on earth he ran his fingers through his thin hair this thought transference he said it's undoubtedly a babylonian ring or it seems so to me but perhaps i have hypnotized myself i will see a doctor the moment i have corrected the last proofs of my book yes do said anthea and thank you so very much 
She took the sovereign and ran down to the others. And now, from the window of a four-wheeled cab, the Queen of Babylon beheld the wonders of London. Buckingham Palace, she thought, uninteresting. Westminster Abbey and the Houses of Parliament, little better. But she liked the tower and the river, and the ships filled her with wonder and delight. But how badly you keep your slaves! how wretched and poor and neglected they seem she said as the cab rattled along the mile end road they aren't slaves they're working people said jane of course they are working that's what slaves are don't you tell me do you suppose i don't know a slave's face when i see it why don't their masters see that they're better fed and better clothed tell me in three words no one answered the wage system of modern england is a little difficult to explain in three words even if you understand it which the children didn't you'll have a revolt of your slaves if you're not careful said the queen oh no said cyril you see they have votes that makes them safe not to revolt it makes all the difference father told me so what is this vote asked the queen is it a charm what do they do with it i, I don't know said the harassed cyril it's just a vote that's all they don't do anything particular with it i see said the queen a sort of plaything well i wish that all these slaves may have in their hands this moment their fill of their favourite meat and drink instantly all the people in the mile end road and in all the other streets where poor people live found their hands full of things to eat and drink from the cab window could be seen persons carrying every kind of food and bottles and cans as well roast meat fowls red lobsters great yellowy crabs fried fish boiled pork beefsteak puddings baked onions mutton pies most of the young people had oranges and sweets and cake it made an enormous change in the look of the mile end road brightened it up so to speak and brightened up more than you can possibly imagine the faces of the people makes a difference doesn't it said the queen that's the best wish you've had yet said jane with cordial approval just by the bank the cabman stopped i ain't gonna drive you no further he said out you gets they got out rather unwillingly i wants my tea he said and they saw that on the box of the cab was a mound of cabbage with pork chops and apple sauce a duck and a spotted currant pudding also a large can you pay me my fare he said threateningly and looked down at the mound muttering again about his tea we'll take another cab said cyril with dignity give me change for a sovereign if you please but the cabman as it turned out was not at all a nice character he took the sovereign whipped up his horse and disappeared in the stream of cabs and omnibuses and wagons without giving them any change at all already a little crowd was collecting round the party come on said robert leading the wrong way the crowd round them thickened they were in a narrow street where many gentlemen in black coats and without hats were standing about on the pavement talking very loudly how ugly their clothes are said the queen of babylon they'd be rather fine men some of them if they were dressed decently especially the ones with the beautiful long curved noses i wish they were dressed like the babylonians of my court and of course it was so the moment the almost fainting samiad had blown itself out every man in throgmorton street appeared abruptly in babylonian full dress all were carefully powdered their hair and beards were scented and curled their garments richly embroidered they wore rings and armlets, flat gold collars and swords, and impossible-looking head-dresses. A stupefied silence fell on them. "'I say,' 
a youth who had always been fair-haired broke that silence it's only fancy of course something wrong with my eyes but you chaps do look so rum rum said his friend look at you you in a sash my hat and your hair has gone black and you have got a beard it's my belief we have been poisoned you do look a jacket old levenstein don't look so bad but how was it done that's what i want to know how was it done is it conjuring or what i think it is just a very bad dream said old levenstein to his clerk all along bishopgate i have seen the gorman people have their hearts full of food good food oh yes without doubt a very bad dream then i'm dreaming too sir said the clerk looking down at his legs with an expression of loathing i see my feet in beastly sandals as plain as plain all that good food wasted said old mr levinstein a bad dream a bad dream the members of the stock exchange are said to be at all times a noisy lot but the noise they made now to express their disgust at the costumes of ancient babylon was far louder than their ordinary row one had to shout before one could hear oneself speak i only wish said the clerk who thought it was conjuring he was quite close to the children and they trembled because they knew that whatever he wished would come true i only wish we knew who'd done it and of course instantly they did know and they pressed round the queen scandalous shameful ought to be put down by law give her in charge fetch the police two or three voices shouted at once the queen recoiled what is it she asked they sound like caged lions lions by the thousand what is it that they say they say police said cyril briefly i knew they would sooner or later and i don't blame them mind you i wish my guards were here cried the queen the exhausted samiad was panting and trembling but the queen's guards in red and green garments and brass and iron gear choked throgmorton street and bared weapons flashed round the queen i'm mad said a mr rosenbaum that's what it is mad it's a judgment on you rosie said his partner i always said you were too hard in that matter of flower do it's a judgment and i'm in it too <laughs> the members of the stock exchange had edged carefully away from the gleaming blades the mailed figures the hard cruel eastern faces but throgmorton street is narrow and the crowd was too thick for them to get away as quickly as they wished kill them cried the queen kill the dogs the guards obeyed it is all a dream cried mr levinstein cowering in a doorway behind his clerk it isn't said the clerk it isn't oh my good gracious those foreign brutes are killing everybody henry hirsch is down now and prentice is cut in two oh lord and hooth and there goes lionel cohen with his head off and guy nichols has lost his head now a dream i wish to goodness it was all a dream and of course instantly it was the entire stock exchange rubbed its eyes and went back to close to over and either side of seven-eighths and trunks and kaffirs and steel common and contangos and backwardations double options and all the interesting subjects concerning which they talk in the street without ceasing no one said a word about it to any one else I think I have explained before that business men do not like it to be known that they have been dreaming in business hours, especially mad dreams, including such dreadful things as hungry people getting dinners and the destruction of the stock exchange. The children were in the dining room at 300 Fitzroy Street, pale and trembling. The Samiad crawled out of the embroidered bag 
and lay flat on the table, its legs stretched out, looking more like a dead hare than anything else. Oh, thank goodness that's over, said Anthea, drawing a deep breath. She won't come back, will she? asked Jane tremulously. No, said Cyril. She's thousands of years ago, but we spent a whole precious pound on her. It'll take all our pocket money for ages to pay that back. Not if it was all a dream, said Robert. The wish said all a dream, you know, Panther. You cut up and ask if he lent you anything. I beg your pardon, said Anthea politely, following the sound of her knock into the presence of the learned gentleman. I'm so sorry to trouble you, but did you lend me a pound today? No, said he, looking kindly at her through his spectacles. But it's extraordinary that you should ask me, for I dozed for a few moments this afternoon, a thing I very rarely do, and I dreamed quite distinctly that you brought me a ring that you said belonged to the Queen of Babylon, and that I lent you a sovereign and that you left one of the queen's rings here. The ring was a magnificent specimen. He sighed. I wish it hadn't been a dream, he said, smiling. He was really learning to smile quite nicely. Anthea could not be too thankful that the Samiad was not there to grant his wish. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of the Story of the Amulet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of the Amulet by Edith Nesbitt. Chapter Nine. Atlantis. You will understand that the adventure of the Babylonian Queen in London was the only one that had occupied any time at all. But the children's time was very fully taken up by talking over all the wonderful things seen and done in the past where by the power of the amulet they seemed to spend hours and hours only to find when they got back to london that the whole thing had been briefer than a lightning flash they talked of the past at their meals in their walks in the dining-room in the first-floor drawing-room but most of all on the stairs it was an old house it had once been a fashionable one and was a fine one still the banister rails of the stairs were excellent for sliding down and in the corners of the landings were big alcoves that had once held graceful statues, and now quite often held the graceful forms of Cyril, Robert, Anthea, and Jane. One day Cyril and Robert, in tight white underclothing, had spent a pleasant hour in reproducing the attitudes of statues seen either in the British Museum or in Father's big photograph book. But the show ended abruptly, because Robert wanted to be the Venus of Milo, and for this purpose pulled at the sheet which served for drapery, at the very moment when Cyril, looking really quite like the Discobolos, with a gold and white saucer for the disc, was standing on one foot, and under that one foot was the sheet. Of course the Discobolos and his disc and the would-be Venus came down together, and every one was a good deal hurt especially the saucer, which would never be the same again, however neatly one might join its uneven bits with secotine or the white of an egg. "'I hope you're satisfied,' said Cyril, holding his head where a large lump was rising. "'Quite, thanks,' said Robert bitterly. His thumb had caught in the banisters and bent itself back almost to breaking point. "'I am so sorry, poor dear Squirrel.' said Anthea. And you were looking so lovely. I'll get a wet rag. Bobs, go and hold your hand under the hot water tap. It's what ballet girls do with their legs when they hurt them. I saw it in a book. What book? said Robert disagreeably. But he went. When he came back, Cyril's head had been bandaged by his sisters, and he had been brought to the state of mind where he was able reluctantly to admit that he supposed Robert hadn't done it on purpose. Robert, replying with equal suavity, Anthea hastened to lead the talk away from the accident. "'I suppose you don't feel like going anywhere through the amulet?' she said. "'Egypt,' said Jane promptly. "'I want to see the pussycats.' "'Not me. Too hot,' said Cyril. "'It's about as much as I can stand here.' 
let alone Egypt. It was indeed hot, even on the second landing, which was the coolest place in the house. Let's go to the North Pole. I don't suppose the amulet was ever there, and we might get our fingers frostbitten so that we could never hold it up to get home again. No thanks, said Robert. I say, said Jane, let's get the Samiad and ask its advice. It will like us asking, even if we don't take it. The Samiad was brought up in its green silk embroidered bag, but before it could be asked anything, the door of the learned gentleman's room opened, and the voice of the visitor who had been lunching with him was heard on the stairs. He seemed to be speaking with the door handle in his hand. You see a doctor, old boy, he said. All that about thought transference is just simply twaddle. You've been overworking. Take a holiday. Go to Dayepi. I'd rather go to Babylon, said the learned gentleman. I'd wish you'd go to Atlantis sometime while we're about it, so as to give me some tips for my nineteenth-century article when you come home. I wish I could, said the voice of the learned gentleman. Goodbye. Take care of yourself. The door was banged and the visitor came smiling down the stairs, a stout, prosperous, big man. The children had to get up to let him pass. "'Hello, kiddies,' he said, glancing at the bandages on the head of Cyril and the hand of Robert. "'Been in the wars?' "'It's all right,' said Cyril. "'I say, what was that Atlantic place you wanted him to go to? We couldn't help hearing you talk.' "'You talk so very loud, you see.' said Jane soothingly. Atlantis, said the visitor, the lost Atlantis, garden of the Hesperides, great continent, disappeared into the sea. You can read about it in Plato. Thank you, said Cyril doubtfully. Were there any amulets there? asked Anthea, made anxious by a sudden thought. Hundreds, I should think. So he's been talking to you? Yes, often. He's very kind to us. We like him awfully. Well, what he wants is a holiday. You persuade him to take one. What he wants is a change of scene. You see, his head is crusted so thickly inside with knowledge about Egypt and Assyria and things that you can't hammer anything into it, unless you keep hard at it all day long for days and days, and I haven't time. But you live in the house. You can hammer almost incessantly. Just try your hands, will you? Right. So long. He went down the stairs three at a time and Jane remarked that he was a nice man, and she thought he had little girls of his own. "'I should like to have them to play with,' she added pensively. The three elder ones exchanged glances. Cyril nodded. "'All right. Let's go to Atlantis,' he said. "'Let's go to Atlantis and take the learned gentleman with us,' said Anthea. "'He'll think it's a dream afterwards, but it'll certainly be a change of scene.' Why not take him to nice Egypt? asked Jane. Too hot, said Cyril shortly. Or Babylon, where he wants to go. I've had enough of Babylon, said Robert. At least for the present. And so have the others. I don't know why, he added, forestalling the question on Jane's lips. But somehow we have. Squirrel, let's take off these beastly bandages and get into flannels. We can't go in our unders. He wished to go to Atlantis, so he's got to go sometime, and he might as well go with us, said Anthea. This was how it was that the learned gentleman, permitting himself a few moments of relaxation in his chair, after the fatigue of listening to opinions about Atlantis and many other things with which he did not at all agree, opened his eyes to find his four young friends standing in front of him in a row. Will you come? said Anthea. To Atlantis with us? To know that you are dreaming shows that the dream is nearly at an end, he told himself. Or perhaps it's only a game, like how many miles to Babylon? So he said aloud, Thank you very much, but I have only a quarter of an hour to spare. It doesn't take any time, said Cyril. Time is only a mode of thought, you know. And you've got to go some time, so why not with us? Very well, said the learned gentleman, now quite certain that he was dreaming. Anthea held out her soft pink hand. He took it. She pulled him gently to his feet. Jane held up the amulet. 
to just outside atlantis said cyril and jane said the name of power you owl said robert it's an island outside an island's all water i won't go i won't said the samiad kicking and struggling in its bag but already the amulet had grown to a great arch cyril pushed the learned gentleman as undoubtedly the first-born through the arch not into water but on to a wooden floor out of doors the others followed the amulet grew smaller again and there they all were standing on the deck of a ship whose sailors were busy making her fast with chains to rings on a white quay side the rings and the chains were of a metal that shone red-yellow like gold everyone on the ship seemed too busy at first to notice the group of newcomers from fitzroy street those who seemed to be officers were shouting orders to the men they stood and looked across the wide quay to the town that rose beyond it what they saw was the most beautiful sight any of them had ever seen or ever dreamed of the blue sea sparkled in soft sunlight little white-capped waves broke softly against the marble breakwaters that guarded the shipping of a great city from the wilderness of winter winds and seas the quay was of marble white and sparkling with a veining bright as gold the city was of marble red and white the greater buildings that seemed to be temples and palaces were roofed with what looked like gold and silver but most of the roofs were of copper that glowed golden red on the houses on the hills among which the city stood and shaded into marvellous tints of green and blue and purple where they had been touched by the salt sea spray and the fumes of the dyeing and smelting works of the lower town broad and magnificent flights of marble stairs led up from the quay to a sort of terrace that seemed to run along for miles and beyond rose the town built on a hill the learned gentleman drew a long breath wonderful he said wonderful i say mr what's your name said robert he means said anthea with gentle politeness that we never can remember your name i know it's mr de something when i was your age i was called jimmy he said timidly would you mind i should feel more at home in a dream like this if i uh, anything that made me seem more like one of you thank you jimmy said anthea with an effort it seemed such a cheek to be saying jimmy to a grown-up man jimmy dear she added with no effort at all jimmy smiled and looked pleased but now the ship was made fast and the captain had time to notice other things he came towards them and he was dressed in the best of all possible dresses for the seafaring life what are you doing here he asked rather fiercely do you come to bless or to curse to bless of course said cyril i'm sorry if it annoys you but we're here by magic we come from the land of the rising sun he went on explanatorily i see said the captain no one had expected that he would i didn't notice at first but of course i hope you're a good omen it's needed and this he pointed to the learned gentleman your slave i presume not at all said anthea he's a very great man a sage don't they call it and we want to see all your beautiful city and your temples and things and then we shall go back and he will tell his friend and his friend will write a book about it what asked the captain fingering a rope is a book a record something written or she added hastily remembering the babylonian writing or engraved some sudden impulse of confidence made jane pluck the amulet from the neck of her frock like this she said the captain looked at it curiously but the other three were relieved to notice without any of that overwhelming interest which the mere name of it had roused in egypt and babylon the stone is of our country he said and that which is engraved on it it is like our writing but i cannot read it 
What is the name of your sage? J Jimmy, said Anthea hesitatingly. The captain repeated, J Jimmy, will you land? He added, And shall I lead you to the king's? Look here, said Robert. Does your king hate strangers? Our kings are ten, said the captain. And the royal line, unbroken from Poseidon, the father of us all, has the noble tradition to do honour to strangers if they come in peace. Then lead on, please, said Robert. Though I should like to see all over your beautiful ship, and sail about in her. That shall be later, said the captain. Just now we're afraid of a storm. Do you notice that odd rumbling? That's nothing, master, said an old sailor who stood near. It's the pilchards coming in, that's all. Too loud, said the captain. There was a rather anxious pause. Then the captain stepped on to the quay, and the others followed him. Do talk to him, Jimmy, said Anthea as they went. You can find out all sorts of things for your friend's book. Please excuse me, he said earnestly. If I talk, I shall wake up. And besides, I can't understand what he says. No one else could think of anything to say, so that it was in complete silence that they followed the captain up the marble steps and through the streets of the town. There were streets and shops and houses and markets. It's just like Babylon, whispered Jane. Only everything's perfectly different. It's a great comfort the ten kings have been properly brought up, to be kind to strangers. Anthea whispered to Cyril. Yes, he said. No deepest dungeons here. There were no horses or chariots in the street, but there were handcarts and low trolleys running on thick log wheels, and porters carrying packets on their heads, and a good many of the people were riding on what looked like elephants, only the great beasts were hairy, and they had not that mild expression we are accustomed to meet on the faces of the elephants at the zoo. Mammoths, murmured the learned gentleman, and stumbled over a loose stone. The people in the streets kept crowding round them as they went along, but the captain always dispersed the crowd before it grew uncomfortably thick by saying, Children of the sun god and their high priest, come to bless the city. And then the people would draw back with a low murmur that sounded like a suppressed cheer. Many of the buildings were covered with gold, but the gold on the bigger buildings was of a different colour, and they had sorts of steeples of burnished silver rising above them. Are all these houses real gold? asked Jane. The temples are covered with gold, of course, answered the captain. But the houses are only orichalcum. It is not quite so expensive. The learned gentleman, now very pale, stumbled along in a dazed way, repeating, Orichalcum, orichalcum. Don't be frightened, said Anthea. We can get home in a minute just by holding up the charm. Would you rather go back now? We could easily come some other day without you. Oh, no, no, he pleaded fervently. Let the dream go on. Please, please do. The high J Jimmy is perhaps weary with his magic journey, said the captain, noticing the blundering walk of the learned gentleman. And we are yet very far from the great temple where today the kings make sacrifice. He stopped at the gate of a great enclosure. It seemed to be a sort of park, for trees showed high above its brazen wall. The party waited, and almost at once the captain came back with one of the hairy elephants and begged them to mount. This they did. It was a glorious ride. The elephant at the zoo... To ride on him is also glorious, but he goes such a very little way, and then he goes back again, which is always dull. But this great hairy beast went on and on and on, along streets and through squares and gardens. It was a glorious city. Almost everything was built of marble, red or white or black. 
every now and then the party crossed a bridge it was not till they had climbed to the hill which is the centre of the town that they saw that the whole city was divided into twenty circles alternately land and water and over each of the water circles were the bridges by which they had come and now they were in a great square a vast building filled up one side of it it was overlaid with gold and had a dome of silver the rest of the buildings round the square were of auriculchum and it looked more splendid than you can possibly imagine standing up bold and shining in the sunlight you would like a bath said the captain as the hairy elephant went clumsily down on his knees it's customary you know before entering the presence we have baths for men women horses and cattle the high-class baths are here our father poseidon gave us a spring of hot water and one of cold the children had never before bathed in baths of gold it feels very splendid said cyril splashing at least of course it's not gold it's or what's its name said robert hand over that towel the bathing hall had several great pools sunk below the level of the floor one went down to them by steps jimmy said anthea timidly when very clean and boiled looking they all met in the flowery courtyard of the public don't you think this all seems much more like now than babylon or egypt oh i forgot you've never been there i know a little of those nations however said he and i quite agree with you a most discerning remark my dear he added awkwardly this city certainly seems to indicate a far higher level of civilization than the egyptian or babylonish and follow me said the captain now boys get out of the way he pushed through a little crowd of boys who were playing with dried chestnuts fastened to a string ginger remarked robert they're playing conkers just like the kids in kentish town road they could see now that three walls surrounded the island on which they were the outermost wall was of brass the captain told them the next which looked like silver was covered with tin and the innermost one was of auriculchum and right in the middle was a wall of gold with golden towers and gates behold the temples of poseidon said the captain it is not lawful for me to enter i will await your return here he told them what they ought to say and the five people from fitzroy street took hands and went forward the golden gates slowly opened we are the children of the sun said cyril as he had been told and our high priest at least that's what the captain calls him we have a different name for him at home what is his name asked a white-robed man who stood in the doorway with his arms extended J jimmy replied cyril and he hesitated as anthea had done it really did seem to be taking a great liberty with so learned a gentleman and we have come to speak with your kings in the temple of poseidon does that word sound right he whispered anxiously quite said the learned gentleman it's very odd i can understand what you say to them but not what they say to you the queen of babylon found that too said cyril it's part of the magic oh what a dream said the learned gentleman the white-robed priest had been joined by others and all were bowing low yonder he said yonder children of the sun with your high g jimmy in an inner courtyard stood the temple all of silver with gold pinnacles and doors and twenty enormous statues in bright gold of men and women also an immense pillar of the other precious yellow metal they went through the doors and the priest led them up a stair into a gallery from which they could look down on to the glorious place the ten kings are even now choosing the bull it is not lawful for me to behold said the priest and fell face downward on the floor outside the gallery the children looked down the roof was of ivory adorned with the three precious metals 
and the walls were lined with the favourite oricalchum. At the far end of the temple was a statue group, the like of which no one living has ever seen. It was of gold, and the head of the chief figure reached to the roof. That figure was Poseidon, the father of the city. He stood in a great chariot drawn by six enormous horses, and round about it were a hundred mermaids riding on dolphins. Ten men, splendidly dressed and armed only with sticks and ropes, were trying to capture one of some fifteen bulls who ran this way and that about the floor of the temple. The children held their breath, for the bulls looked dangerous, and the great horned heads were swinging more and more wildly. Antia did not like looking at the bulls. She looked about the gallery, and noticed that another staircase led up from it to a still higher story. Also, that a door led out into the open air, where there seemed to be a balcony, so that when a shout went up and Robert whispered, Got him, and she looked down and saw the herd of bulls being driven out of the temple by whips, and the ten kings following, one of them spurring with his stick a black bull that writhed and fought in the grip of a lasso, she answered the boys agitated, Now we shan't see anything more, with, Yes, we can, there's an outside balcony. So they crowded out, but very soon the girls crept back. I don't like sacrifices, Jane said. So she and Anthea went and talked to the priest, who was no longer lying on his face, but sitting on the top step, mopping his forehead with his robe, for it was a hot day. It's a special sacrifice, he said. Usually it is only done on the justice days every five years and six years alternately and then they drink the cup of wine with some of the bull's blood in it and swear to judge truly and they wear the sacred blue robe and put out all the temple fires but this today is because the city is so upset by the odd noises from the sea and the god inside the big mountain speaking with his thunder voice but all that has happened so often before if anything could make me uneasy it wouldn't be that what would it be asked jane kindly it would be the lemmings who are they enemies they are a sort of rat and every year they come swimming over from the country that no man knows and stay here a while and then swim away this year they haven't come. You know rats won't stay on a ship that is going to be wrecked. If anything horrible were going to happen to us, it's my belief those lemmings would know, and that may be why they have fought shy of us. What do you call this country? asked the Samiad, suddenly putting its head out of its bag. Atlantis, said the priest then I advise you to get on to the highest ground you can find. I remember hearing something about a flood here. Look here, you. It turned to Anthea. Let's get home. The prospect's too wet for my whiskers. The girls obediently went to find their brothers, who were leaning on the balcony railings. Where's the learned gentleman? asked Anthea. There he is, below, said the priest, who had come with them. Your high G. Jimmy is with the kings. The ten kings were no longer alone. The learned gentleman, no one had noticed how he got there, stood with them on the steps of an altar, on which lay the dead body of the black bull. All the rest of the courtyard was thick with people, seemingly of all classes, and all were shouting, The sea! The sea! be calm said the most kingly of the kings he who had lassoed the bull our town is strong against the thunders of the sea and of the sky i want to go home whined the samiad we can't go without him said anthea firmly jimmy she called jimmy and waved to him he heard her and began to come towards her through the crowd they could see from the balcony the sea captain edging his way out from among the people, and his face was dead white, like paper. To the hills, 
he cried in a loud and terrible voice and above his voice came another voice louder more terrible the voice of the sea the girls looked seaward across the smooth distance of the sea something huge and black rolled towards the town it was a wave but a wave a hundred feet in height a wave that looked like a mountain a wave rising higher and higher till suddenly it seemed to break in two one half of it rushed out to sea again the other oh cried anthea the town the poor people it's all thousands of years ago really said robert but his voice trembled they hid their eyes for a moment they could not bear to look down for the wave had broken on the face of the town sweeping over the quays and docks overwhelming the great storehouses and factories tearing gigantic stones from forts and bridges and using them as battering rams against the temples great ships were swept over the roofs of the houses and dashed down halfway up the hill among ruined gardens and broken buildings the water ground brown fishing boats to powder on the golden roofs of palaces then the wave swept back towards the sea i want to go home cried the samiad fiercely oh yes yes said jane and the boys were ready but the learned gentleman had not come then suddenly they heard him dash up to the inner gallery crying i must see the end of the dream he rushed up the higher flight the others followed him they found themselves in a sort of turret roofed but open to the air at the sides the learned gentleman was leaning on the parapet and as they rejoined him the vast wave rushed back on the town this time it rose higher destroyed more come home cried the samiad that's the last i know it is that's the last over there it pointed with a claw that trembled oh come cried jane holding up the amulet i will see the end of the dream cried the learned gentleman you'll never see anything else if you do said cyril oh jimmy appealed anthea i'll never bring you out again you'll never have the chance if you don't go soon said the samiad i will see the end of the dream said the learned gentleman obstinately the hills around were black with people fleeing from the villages to the mountains and even as they fled thin smoke broke from the great white peak and then a faint flash of flame then the volcano began to throw up its mysterious fiery inside parts the earth trembled ashes and sulphur showered down a rain of fine pumice stone fell like snow on all the dry land the elephants from the forest rushed up towards the peaks great lizards thirty yards long broke from the mountain pools and rushed down towards the sea the snows melted and rushed down first in avalanches then in roaring torrents great rocks cast up by the volcano fell splashing in the sea miles away oh this is a horrible cried anthea come home come home the end of the dream gasped the learned gentleman hold up the amulet cried the samiad suddenly the place where they stood was now crowded with men and women and the children were strained tight against the parapet the turret rocked and swayed the wave had reached the golden wall jane held up the amulet now cried the samiad say the word and as jane said it the samiad leapt from its bag and bit the hand of the learned gentleman at the same moment the boys pushed him through the arch and all followed him he turned to look back and through the arch he saw nothing but a waste of waters with above it the peak of the terrible mountain with fire raging from it he staggered back to his chair what a ghastly dream he gasped oh you're here my uh, dears can i do anything for you you've hurt your hand said anthea gently let me bind it up the hand was indeed bleeding rather badly the samiad had crept back to its bag all the children were very white never again said the samiad later on will i go into the past with a grown-up person i will say for you four 
You do do as you're told. We didn't even find the amulet, said Antia later still. Of course you didn't. It wasn't there. Only the stone it was made of was there. It fell onto a ship miles away that managed to escape and got to Egypt. I could have told you that. I wish you had, said Antia, and her voice was still rather shaky. Why didn't you? You never asked me, said the Samiad very sulkily. I'm not the sort of chap to go shoving my oar in where it's not wanted. Mr. J Jimmy's friend will have something worth having to put in his article now, said Cyril very much later indeed. Not he, said Robert sleepily. The learned J Jimmy will think it's a dream, and it's ten to one he never tells the other chap a word about it at all. Robert was quite right on both points. The learned gentleman did, and he never did. End of chapter 9、Chapter 10 The Little Black Girl and Julius Caesar A great city swept away by the sea, a beautiful country devastated by an active volcano. These are not the sort of things you see every day of the week, and when you do see them, no matter how many other wonders you may have seen in your time, such sights are rather apt to take your breath away. Atlantis had certainly this effect on the breaths of Cyril, Robert, Anthea, and Jane. They remained in a breathless state for some days. The learned gentleman seemed as breathless as any one. He spent a good deal of what little breath he had in telling Anthea about a wonderful dream he had. You would hardly believe, he said, that anyone could have such a detailed vision. But Anthea could believe it, she said, quite easily. He had ceased to talk about thought transference. He had now seen. Too many wonders to believe that. In consequence of their breathless condition, none of the children suggested any new excursions through the amulet. Robert voiced the mood of the others when he said that they were fed up with amulet for a bit. They undoubtedly were. As for the Samiad, it went to sand and stayed there, worn out by the terror of the flood and the violent exercise it had had to take. In obedience to the inconsiderate wishes of the learned gentleman and the Babylonian queen, the children let it sleep. The danger of taking it about among strange people who might at any moment utter undesirable wishes was becoming more and more plain. And there are pleasant things to be done in London without any aid from amulets or samiads. You can, for instance, visit the Tower of London, the Houses of Parliament. The National Gallery, the Zoological Gardens, the various parks, the museums at South Kensington, Madame Tussaud's exhibition of waxworks, or the botanical gardens at Kew. You can go to Kew by river steamer, and this is the way that the children would have gone if they had gone at all. Only they never did, because it was when they were discussing the arrangements for the journey and what they should take with them to eat, and how much of it, and what the whole thing would cost. That the adventure of the little black girl began to happen. The children were sitting on a seat in St. James's Park. They had been watching the pelican repulsing with careful dignity the advances of the seagulls, who are always so anxious to play games with it. The pelican thinks very properly that it hasn't the figure for games, so it spends most of its time pretending that that is not the reason why it won't play. The breathlessness caused by Atlantis was wearing off a little. Cyril, who always wanted to understand all about everything, was turning things over in his mind. I'm not. I'm only thinking, he answered, when Robert asked him what he was so grumpy about. I'll tell you when I've thought it all out. If it's about the amulet, I don't want to hear it, said Jane. Nobody asked you to. Retorted Cyril mildly. 
and I haven't finished my inside thinking about it yet. Let's go to Kew in the meantime. I'd rather go in a steamer, said Robert, and the girls laughed. That's right, said Cyril. Be funny. I would. Well, he was, rather, said Anthea. I wouldn't think, Squirrel, if it hurts you so, said Robert kindly. Oh, shut up, said Cyril, or else talk about Q. I want to see the palms there, said Anthea hastily, to see if they're anything like the ones on the island where we united the cook and the burglar by the reverend half-curate. All disagreeableness was swept away in a pleasant tide of recollections, and— Do you remember? They said. Have you forgotten? My hat, remarked Cyril pensively, as the flood of reminiscences ebbed a little. We have had some times. We have that, said Robert. Don't let's have any more, said Jane anxiously. That's what I was thinking about, Cyril replied. And just then they heard the little black girl sniff. She was quite close to them. She was not really a little black girl. She was shabby and not very clean, and she had been crying so much that you could hardly see through the narrow chink between her swollen lids how very blue her eyes were. It was her dress that was black, and it was too big and too long for her, and she wore a speckled black ribbon sailor hat that would have fitted a much bigger head than her little flaxen one, and she stood looking at the children and sniffing. Oh, dear, said Anthea, jumping up. Whatever is the matter? She put her hand on the little girl's arm. It was rudely shaken off. You leave me be, said the little girl. I ain't doing nothing to you. But what is it? Anthea asked. Has someone been hurting you? What's that to you? said the little girl fiercely. You're all right. Come away, said Robert pulling at Anthea's sleeve. She's a nasty, rude little kid. Oh, no, said Anthea. She's only dreadfully unhappy. What is it? She asked again. Oh, you're all right, the child repeated. You ain't a going to the union. Can't we take you home? said Anthea, and Jane added. Where does your mother live? She don't live nowhere. She's dead. So now, said the little girl fiercely, in tones of miserable triumph. Then she opened her swollen eyes widely, stamped her foot in fury, and ran away. She ran no further than to the next bench, flung herself down there, and began to cry without even trying not to. Anthea, quite at once, went to the little girl and put her arms as tight as she could round the hunched-up black figure. Oh, don't cry so, dear, don't, don't, she whispered under the brim of the large sailor hat, now very crooked indeed. Tell Anthea all about it. Anthea'll help you. There, there, dear, don't cry. The others stood at a distance. One or two passers-by stared curiously. The child was now only crying part of the time. The rest of the time she seemed to be talking to Anthea. Presently, Anthea beckoned Cyril. It's horrible, she said in a furious whisper. Her father was a carpenter, and he was a steady man, and never touched a drop except on a Saturday, and he came up to London for work, and there wasn't any, and then he died, and her name is Imogen, and she's nine come next November, and now her mother's dead, and she's to stay tonight with Mrs. Shrobsall, that's the landlady that's been kind, and tomorrow the relieving officer is coming for her, and she's going into the union. That means the workhouse. It's too terrible. What can we do? Let's ask the learned gentleman, said Jane brightly, and as no one else could think of anything better, the whole party walked back to Fitzroy Street as fast as it could, the little girl holding tight to Anthea's hand, and now not crying any more, only sniffing gently. The learned gentleman looked up from his writing with the smile that had grown much easier to him than it used to be. They were quite at home in his room now. It really seemed to welcome them. Even the mummy case appeared to smile, as if, in its distant, superior, ancient Egyptian way, it were rather pleased to see them than not. 
Anthea sat on the stairs with Imogen, who was nine come next November, while the others went in and explained the difficulty. The learned gentleman listened with grave attention. It really does seem rather rough luck, Cyril concluded, because I've often heard about rich people who wanted children most awfully, though I know I never should. But they do. There must be somebody who'd be glad to have her. Gypsies are awfully fond of children, Robert hopefully said. They're always stealing them. Perhaps they'd have her. She's quite a nice little girl, really, Jane added. She was only rude at first because we looked jolly and happy and she wasn't. You understand that, don't you? Yes, said he, absently fingering a little blue image from Egypt. I understand that very well. As you say, there must be some home where she would be welcome. He scowled thoughtfully at the little blue image. Anthea, outside, thought the explanation was taking a very long time. She was so busy trying to cheer and comfort the little black girl that she never noticed the Samyad, who, roused from sleep by her voice, had shaken itself free of sand and was coming crookedly up the stairs. It was close to her before she saw it. She picked it up and settled it in her lap. "'What is it?' asked the black child. "'Is it a cat or an organ monkey, or what?' And then Anthea heard the learned gentleman say, "'Yes, I wish we could find a home where they would be glad to have her.' And instantly she felt the Samiad begin to blow itself out as it sat on her lap. She jumped up, lifting the Samiad in her skirt, and, holding Imogen by the hand, rushed into the learned gentleman's room. "'At least let's keep together,' she cried. "'All hold hands, quick!' The circle was like that formed for the mulberry bush or ring of roses, and Anthea was only able to take part in it by holding in her teeth the hem of her frock, which, thus supported, formed a bag to hold the Samiad. "'Is it a game?' asked the learned gentleman feebly. No one answered. There was a moment of suspense. Then came that curious upside-down, inside-out sensation, which one almost always feels when transported from one place to another by magic. Also, there was that dizzy dimness of sight which comes on these occasions. The mist cleared. The upside-down, inside-out sensation subsided, and there stood the six in a ring as before only their twelve feet instead of standing on the carpet of the learned gentleman's room stood on green grass above them instead of the dusky ceiling of the fitzroy street floor was a pale blue sky and where the walls had been and the painted mummy case were tall dark green trees oaks and ashes and in between the trees and under them tangled bushes and creeping ivy there were beech trees too but there was nothing under them but their own dead red drifted leaves and here and there a delicate green fern frond and there they stood in a circle still holding hands as though they were playing ring of roses or the mulberry bush just six people hand in hand in a wood that sounds simple but then you must remember that they did not know where the wood was and what's more they didn't know when the wood was there was a curious sort of feeling that made the learned gentleman say, "'Another dream! Dear me!' and made the children almost certain that they were in a time a very long while ago. As for little Imogen, she said, "'Oh, my!' and kept her mouth very much open indeed. "'Where are we?' Cyril asked the Samiad. "'In Britain,' said the Samiad. "'But when?' asked Anthea anxiously. About the year fifty-five before the year you reckon time from, said the Samiad crossly. Is there anything else you want to know? It added, sticking its head out of the bag formed by Anthea's blue linen frock, and turning its snail's eyes to right and left. I've been here before. It's very little changed. Yes, but why here? asked Anthea. Your inconsiderate friend, the Samiad replied, wished to find some home where they would be glad to have that unattractive and immature female human being whom you have picked up, 
gracious knows how in megatherium days properly brought up children didn't talk to shabby strangers in parks your thoughtless friend wanted a place where someone would be glad to have this undesirable stranger and now here you are i see we are said anthea patiently looking round on the tall gloom of the forest but why here why now you don't suppose anyone would want a child like that in your times in your towns said the samiad in irritated tones you've got your country into such a mess that there's no room for half your children and no one to want them that's not our doing you know said anthea gently and bringing me here without any waterproof or anything said the samiad still more crossly when everyone knows how damp and foggy ancient britain was here take my coat said robert taking it off anthea spread the coat on the ground and putting the samiad on it folded it round so that only the eyes and furry ears showed there she said comfortingly now if it does begin to look like rain i can cover you up in a minute now what are we to do the others who had stopped holding hands crowded round to hear the answer to this question imogen whispered in an awed tone can't the organ monkey talk neither i thought it was only parrots do replied the samiad i don't care what you do and it drew head and ears into the tweed covering of robert's coat the others looked at each other it's only a dream said the learned gentleman hopefully something is sure to happen if we can prevent ourselves from waking up and sure enough something did the brooding silence of the dark forest was broken by the laughter of children and the sound of voices let's go and see said cyril it's only a dream said the learned gentleman to jane who hung back if you don't go with the tide of a dream if you resist you wake up you know there was a sort of break in the undergrowth that was like a silly person's idea of a path they went along this in indian file the learned gentleman leading quite soon they came to a large clearing in the forest there were a number of houses huts perhaps you would have called them with a sort of mud and wood fence it's like the old egyptian town whispered anthea and it was rather some children with no clothes on at all were playing what looked like ring of roses or mulberry bush that is to say they were dancing round in a ring holding hands on a grassy bank several women dressed in blue and white robes and tunics of beast skins sat watching the playing children the children from fitzroy street stood on the fringe of the forest looking at the games one woman with long fair braided hair sat a little apart from the others and there was a look in her eyes as she followed the play of the children that made anthea feel sad and sorry none of those little girls is her own little girl thought anthea the little black-clad london child pulled at anthea's sleeve Look she said that one there she's precious like mother mother's air was something lovely when she had time to comb it out mother wouldn't never beat me if she lived here i don't suppose there's ear a public nearer than epping do you miss in her eagerness the child had stepped out of the shelter of the forest the sad-eyed woman saw her she stood up her thin face lighted up with a radiance like sunrise her long lean arms stretched towards the london child imogen she cried at least the word was more like that than any other word imogen there was a moment of great silence the naked children paused in their play the women on the bank stared anxiously oh it is mother it is cried imogen from london and rushed across the cleared space she and her mother clung together so closely so strongly that they stood an instant like a statue carved in stone then the women crowded round it 
is my Imogen? cried the woman. Oh, it is, and she wasn't eaten by wolves. She's come back to me. Tell me, my darling, how did you escape? Where have you been? Who has fed and clothed you? I don't know nothing, said Imogen. Poor child, whispered the women who crowded round. The terror of the wolves has turned her brain. But you know me, said the fair-haired woman and Imogen, clinging with black-clothed arms to the bare neck, answered, Oh, yes, mother, I know you right enough. What is it? What do they say? the learned gentleman asked anxiously. You wished to come where someone wanted the child, said the Samiad. The child says this is her mother. And the mother? You can see, said the Samiad. But is she really? Her child, I mean. Who knows? said the Samiad. But each one fills the empty place in the other's heart. It's enough. Oh, said the learned gentleman. This is a good dream. I wish the child might stay in the dream. The Samiad blew itself out and granted the wish. So Imogen's future was assured. She had found someone to want her. If only all the children that no one wants, began the learned gentleman, but the woman interrupted. She came towards them. Welcome all, she cried. I am the queen, and my child tells me that you have befriended her. And this I well believe looking on your faces. Your garb is strange, but faces I can read. The child is bewitched, I see that well, but in this she speaks truth. Is it not so? The children said it wasn't worth mentioning. I wish you could have seen all the honours and kindnesses lavished on the children and the learned gentlemen by those ancient Britons. You would have thought, to see them, that a child was something to make a fuss about, not a bit of rubbish to be hustled about the streets and hidden away in the workhouse. It wasn't as grand as the entertainment at Babylon, but somehow it was more satisfying. I think you children have some wonderful influence on me said the learned gentleman. I never dreamed such dreams before I knew you. It was when they were alone that night under the stars, where the Britons had spread a heap of dried fern for them to sleep on, that Cyril spoke. Well, he said, we've made it all right for Imogen, and had a jolly good time. I vote we get home again before the fighting begins. What fighting? asked Jane sleepily. Why, Julius Caesar, you little goat, replied her kind brother. Don't you see that if this is the year 55, Julius Caesar may happen at any moment? I thought you liked Caesar, said Robert. So I do, in the history. But that's different from being killed by his soldiers. If we saw Caesar, we might persuade him not to, said Anthea. You persuade Caesar, Robert laughed. The learned gentleman, before anyone could stop him, said, I only wish we could see Caesar some time. And of course, in just the little time the Samiad took to blow itself out for wish-giving, the five, or six counting the Samiad, found themselves in Caesar's camp, just outside Caesar's tent, and they saw Caesar. The Samiad must have taken advantage of the loose wording of the learned gentleman's wish, for it was not the same time of day as that on which the wish had been uttered among the dried ferns. It was sunset, and the great man sat on a chair outside his tent, gazing over the sea towards Britain. Everyone knew without being told that it was towards Britain. Two golden eagles on the top of posts stood on each side of the tent, and on the flaps of the tent, which was very gorgeous to look at, were the letters SPQR. The great man turned unchanged on the newcomers the august glance that he had turned on the violet waters of the channel. Though they had suddenly appeared out of nothing, Caesar never showed by the faintest movement of an eyelid, by the least tightening of that firm mouth, that they were not some long-expected embassy. He waved a calm hand towards the sentinels, who sprang weapons in hand towards the newcomers. Back! he said, in a voice that thrilled like music. 
since when has caesar feared children and students to the children he seemed to speak in the only language they knew but the learned gentleman heard in rather a strange accent but quite intelligibly the lips of caesar speaking in the latin tongue and in that tongue a little stiffly he answered it is a dream o caesar a dream repeated caesar what is a dream this said the learned gentleman not it said cyril it's a sort of magic we come out of another time and another place and we want to ask you not to trouble about conquering britain said anthea it's a poor little place not worth bothering about are you from britain the general asked your clothes are uncouth but well woven and your hair is short as the hair of roman citizens not long like the hair of barbarians yet such i deem you to be we're not said jane with angry eagerness we're not barbarians at all we come from the country where the sun never sets and we've read about you in books and our country's full of fine things st paul's and the tower of london and madame tussaud's exhibition and then the others stopped her don't talk nonsense said robert in a bitter undertone caesar looked at the children a moment in silence then he called a soldier and spoke with him apart then he said aloud you three elder children may go where you will within the camp few children are privileged to see the camp of caesar the student and the smaller girl child will remain here with me nobody liked this but when caesar said a thing that thing was so and there was an end to it so the three went left alone with jane and the learned gentleman the great roman found it easy enough to turn them inside out but it was not easy even for him to make head or tail of the insides of their minds when he had got at them the learned gentleman insisted that the whole thing was a dream and refused to talk much on the ground that if he did he would wake up jane closely questioned was full of information about railways electric lights balloons men of war cannons and dynamite and do they fight with swords asked the general yes swords and guns and cannons caesar wanted to know what guns were you fire them said jane and they go bang and people fall down dead but what are guns like jane found them hard to describe but robert has a toy one in his pocket she said so the others were recalled the boys explained the pistol to caesar very fully and he looked at it with the greatest interest it was a two-shilling pistol the one that had done such good service in the old egyptian village i shall cause guns to be made said caesar and you will be detained till i know whether you have spoken the truth i had just decided that britain was not worth the bother of invading but what you tell me decides me that it is very much worth while but it's all nonsense said anthea britain is just a savage sort of island all fogs and trees and big rivers but the people are kind we know a little girl there named imogen and it's no use your making guns because you can't fire them without gunpowder and that won't be invented for hundreds of years and we don't know how to make it and we can't tell you do go straight home dear caesar and let poor little britain alone but this other girl child says said caesar all jane's been telling you is what it's going to be anthea interrupted hundreds and thousands of years from now little one is a prophet does eh? said caesar with a whimsical look huh, rather young for the business isn't she you can call her a prophetess if you like said cyril but what anthea says is true anthea said caesar that's a greek name very likely said cyril worriedly i say i do wish you'd give up this idea of conquering britain it's not worth while really it isn't on the contrary said caesar what you've told me has decided me to go if it's only to find out what britain is really like guards detain these children quick said robert before the guards begin detaining we had enough of that in babylon 
Jane held up the amulet away from the sunset and said the word. The learned gentleman was pushed through, and the others, more quickly than ever before, passed through the arch back into their own times and the quiet, dusty sitting-room of the learned gentleman. It is a curious fact that when Caesar was encamped on the coast of Gaul, somewhere near Boulogne it was, I believe, he was sitting before his tent in the glow of the sunset, looking out over the violet waters of the English Channel. Suddenly he started, rubbed his eyes, and called his secretary. The young man came quickly from within the tent. Marcus, said Caesar, I have dreamed a very wonderful dream. Some of it I forget, but I remember enough to decide what was not before determined. Tomorrow, the ships that have been brought round from the Ligurus shall be provisioned. We shall sail for this three-cornered island. First, we will take but two legions. This, if what we have heard be true, should suffice. But if my dream be true, then a hundred legions will not suffice. For the dream I dreamed was the most wonderful that ever tormented the brain, even of Caesar and caesar has dreamed some strange things in his time and if you hadn't told caesar all that about how things are now he'd never have invaded britain said robert to jane as they sat down to tea oh nonsense said anthea pouring out it was all settled hundreds of years ago i don't know said cyril jam please this about time being only a thing of me of thought is very confusing if everything happens at the same time it can't said anthea stoutly the present's the present and the past's the past not always said cyril when we were in the past the present was the future now then he added triumphantly and anthea could not deny it i should have liked to see more of the camp said robert yes we didn't get much for our money but Imogen is happy, that's one thing, said Anthea. We left her happy in the past. I've often seen about people being happy in the past, in poetry books. I see what it means now. It's not a bad idea, said the Samiad sleepily, putting its head out of its bag and taking it in again suddenly. Be left in the past. Everyone remembered this afterwards when... End of chapter 10